Thank you very much. So the title, the title of this presentation is actually a little bit different than the title that's in your program. And the reason for that, I'll, I'll highlight a little bit later and make sure to come back to that. Just a quick review. Um, there are multiple types of radioactive decay. There's actually more than we see on this screen, but these are the four that occur under the most common circumstances. And in nuclear medicine, we've been used to dealing with uh, many of these in both a diagnostic and therapeutic application. Gamma photons, obviously, we use on a day-to-day -day basis for many of our imaging studies. Beta decay, we use for I-131. We use for yttrium-90. It's a very um, uh, widely used form of radioisotope therapy. There are some elements that undergo proton decay, but we don't tend to use those in nuclear medicine, but we do use positron decay. That should be positron, um, which we use for PET imaging on a day-to-day -day basis. But the last one in the list, alpha decay, is one that we've not traditionally had a lot of experience with. There's been a few studies over the years with various compounds like holmium and others <clears throat> that undergo alpha decay, but these have never really entered into mainstream clinical care. With the advent of radium-223, however, we now see our first isotope coming into common clinical practice, which does undergo alpha decay. And just as a reminder, an alpha particle is composed of two protons and two neutrons. So it's a very heavy particle and very highly charged with a charge of plus two. If you look at the rest mass energy, electrons and positrons both have energies of 511 MeV, uh, rather 0.511 MeV, giving rise to our dual uh, uh, proton, uh, photons, rather, you can see an alpha particle has 3,800 mega electron volt rest mass energy. So that's a lot of energy that these particles are carrying away from the site of decay. <clears throat> when we talk about radiation dosimetry and the effect of radiation in the body, we talk about relative biological effectiveness. This is more or less a random um, numerical value. It's not something that we can measure empirically, <clears throat> but it's based on mathematical modeling. And it's used to denote the amount of energy deposition that occurs from those particles in the soft tissue when that particle interacts with tissues in the body. It's based on the type of particle, the energy of mission, and the relative biologic effects of that particle. You can see that beta particles are assigned a value of one. So they, they deposit some energy, cause some local radiation injury. Neutron therapy used in some forms of external beam radiation therapy have a higher um, RBE value of 10. Alpha particles have a value of 20. So 20 times more biological effectiveness than we see with beta particles. <clears throat> Again, we can see that the alpha particle is very similar to a helium nucleus. Both are comprised of protons and neutrons, um, just that the helium also has electrons orbiting that nucleus. <clears throat> in terms of biological effectiveness, this is the type of thing that we think is happening. So beta particles and high energy ionizing gamma radiation cause DNA strand breaks, but they tend to be single strand breaks. And those single strand breaks, because the strand is still intact, can be repaired with the enzymatic repair mechanism. Alpha particles cause much more local injury, lots, much more local molecular damage, and have the potential to induce double strand DNA breaks, which are very difficult to the bot for the body to repair because those ends then are discontinuous and the repair mechanism cannot compensate for that degree of, um, of injury. An interesting phenomenon that I've come across when, when reading about the effects of radiation in the body is the concept of, of dose distribution and path length. So we tend to think about these things, um, and we heard in the previous lecture that the Y90 has a certain path length, that the radiation is deposited, deposited over a certain length. When you look at what's taking place in the body, what we see is our curves similar to this, where there's deposition all along this path length and that when it reaches a certain level that's more or less at background radiation, we extrapolate the range and say this is the average depth of penetration of a beta particle. What we see with alpha particles, and we see the same thing with proton radiotherapy, is that these heavy particles travel a certain distance in the tissue with very little interaction, and it's only when they lose enough kinetic energy that all of the energy is deposited at that point of, um, of the point of uh, range. And so these particles travel with relatively little interaction in the tissue until it reaches its range, and then the particle stops. And all of that kinetic energy, all of that charge energy, rest mass energy is deposited at a point at where that is occurring and the interaction with the tissue is taking place. And for alpha particles, you can see this is quite low, 50 to 100 microns. So in, as opposed to millimeters, like we see with beta particles, this is much shorter, only several cell widths in diameter. 
Likewise, the linear, linear energy transfer um, looks like this, that all of that energy deposition is occurring around that site of mean range. But when that deposition occurs, you're getting all of the energy of that alpha particle being deposited at that, at that site, again, causing a great degree of tissue injury. So let's talk a little bit about treatment of bone metastases. We've had many elements in the past that have been used for treatment of bone met metastatic disease, um, several of which occur in this column, the alkaline earth elements. You can see that at the top of this is calcium, and the skeleton obviously has a lot of calcium in it. So the bone matrix has an affinity for calcium, but chemically these elements behave very similar to calcium in the body. So one of the first that was used, and used fairly extensively, also here in Kuwait I understand, is strontium-89, administered as a dichloride salt. Now this isotope has a half-life of 50.5 days, has a high energy beta decay with a mega... Uh, energy of 1.463 mega electron volts. The higher that energy, the farther that uh, beta particle travels before eventually losing its energy. So one of the side effects of strontium was marrow suppression because although it's localizing to the cortex, you get several millimeters worth of travel of that beta particle, which does result in a degree of marrow suppression. The next agent that came along was samarium-153, which you can see is down here in the periodic table, not really having in and of itself any affinity for the skeleton, but this was hooked up to a pharmaceutical agent, EDTMP, which you can see down at the bottom, has a phosphonic acid component to it, similar to the bisphosphonates. So it's that pharmaceutical carrier that takes it to the skeleton. The samarium-153 itself has a half-life of 1.93 days, so a shorter half-life. It has a dual mode of decay, so it has a beta particle that results in the therapy, and it has a uh, gamma photon that allows us to actually take fairly nice images of patients uh, who are given samarium-153. However, for both of these agents, all they were ever used for and approved for was palliation of bone pain. They were given to patients with symptomatic bone disease, and we knew that we could make their pain better with the administration of these agents. Now, the latest one to come along is actually further down on the um, alkaline earth column, radium, and this particular isotope is radium-223. Now, there's a lot of, lot of papers and literature on radium, but they're mostly the forms of radium that have half-lives of 10,000 years and cause radiation poisoning and not radiation therapy. But this particular isoform of radium has quite favorable characteristics. It has a half-life of 11.43 days, and it has a multi-step decay pathway that I'll elucidate in just a minute, but liberating four alpha particles in the course of that decay scheme. So you not only get one hit of alpha per decay, you get four hits of alpha particle for each radium molecule that decays. There are also some low abundance beta particles and some low abundance gamma rays that come out as part of that decay cascade as well. There actually have been several um, alpha particles, alpha emitting isotopes that have been looked at in the medical field. Um, when I was a fellow at Duke University, we were looking at astatine 211. Um, this is analogous to iodine. It's in the um, in that group. So you can actually hook it up to monoclonal antibodies and other proteins um, similar to you would do with iodine-131 or I-123. But astatine-211 is difficult to produce. You need a high energy cyclotron. You only get one alpha particle per decay. Um, it actually comes from a, a reactor, I'm sorry. And it's only been used in the research setting. Similarly, bismuth-213 and actidium-225 both have their limitations. But as I said, radium-223 has very favorable characteristics, including the fact that this comes from a generator. And so you need to produce the actinium-227 parent, but then that is loaded into a generator, and the generator is eluded to produce radium-223. So it makes it a much more achievable form of radioactive isotope. Once you elute the radium-223, then that goes into the patient and decays via the following cascade. Radium-223 initially decays with an 11.4-day half-life to radon-219. Now, I mentioned that the, the half-life of radium-223 is quite favorable, much shorter than our traditional forms of radium. One of the other differences about this particular isotope that has prevented the use of radium in the past is the radon daughter. Radon is a gas. And so it is going to diffuse away. Once you decay radium to radon, that radon is going to freely diffuse in the body. And some of the radium isotopes that have been looked at in the past have had radon daughters that have had half-lives of hours to days. At that point, that's just going to diffuse away. It's going to come out of the body and cause no therapeutic effect. With the four-second half-life, that radon daughter doesn't exist for very long before it's again going to decay. So all of this decay cascade is basically staying in the vicinity of the localization of the radium-223. 
Next, you get polonium-215, which decays down to lead-211. Then there's a dual pathway. You get beta decay down to bismuth-211. That can either go to polonium-211, then to lead-207, or down to thallium-207 and to lead-207. Either way, you get one additional alpha decay and one additional beta decay out of that cascade. You can see that the end result of all this is lead-207. That's the end isotope of this. This is a stable element of lead. Um, I don't usually tell the patients that the radium that we're giving is going to end up being lead in their body, but it's a very small amount and thought to have no, no ill effects. So radium was recently approved by the FDA for use in the United States. Um, the inclusion criteria, according to the package insert, are for men with castration-resistant prostate carcinoma, symptomatic osseous metastatic disease, and no known visceral metastatic disease. Now, the reason I highlight known is that it doesn't say that you need to do a scan to exclude visceral metastatic disease. It doesn't say you need to perform a CT on all these patients. They just can't be known to have metast uh, visceral metastatic disease. To me, visceral means primarily lung, liver, and brain. Um, and pulmonary metastatic disease and liver metastatic disease are the most common sites that we see from this particular therapy, uh, sorry, from this particular cancer. There are multiple sites of other metastatic disease that would not be considered visceral. And so we routinely treat patients that have nodal metastatic disease. Sometimes they'll have recurrent disease in the prostate bed or involving the wall of the urinary bladder. These are things that are not a, not a contraindication to the use of radium-223. The only exclusion criteria, interestingly enough, is pregnancy, um, which seems a little bit counterintuitive as this is a treatment that's approved for use in men with prostate cancer who should have no chance of getting pregnant. But nevertheless, this, we could use this potentially in an off-label fashion for other types of malignancies, and so they did need to include this in the package insert that you need to make sure if you're going to use it in a female patient in an off-label fashion, they cannot be pregnant. You would have to, to prove that they don't uh, carry a pregnancy. There is a recommendation in the package insert that says that radium-223 should not be co-administered with chemotherapy because of concern over an additive effect on the marrow, that the radium-223 potentially could suppress the marrow, chemotherapy can suppress the marrow, and when you put the two of those together, we don't know what that cumulative effect is going to be, but the concern is that you could precipitate um, profound anemia or thrombocytopenia in that setting. We have given radium with chemotherapy in some patients in a very cautious fashion and so far have not experienced any ill effects. Again, this is not a contraindication. This is just a statement that's in the package insert that it should not be given together. The recommendations when giving radium are that you monitor blood counts both at baseline and prior to each um, administration of radium-223 there are some certain thresholds that are required. So prior to baseline, they recommend that the patients have at least a neutrophil, absolute neutrophil count of greater than 1.5 times 10 to the ninth. The platelet count should be at least 100,000, and the hemoglobin should be greater than 10. Prior to the subsequent administration, you no longer need to follow the hemoglobin. The hemoglobin is not so much a concern, but you need to make sure the A and C is above one and the platelets are above 50. So those are the values that we follow. Um, the recommendation in the package insert is that if they are below those values, that you can delay the next therapy of radium by several weeks, waiting for those counts to recover. So just because at week four they're not bounced back to the where they should be, you can just wait a little bit longer for the counts to come back. But if you've gone six to eight weeks and the counts are not recovering, the recommendation is that you cease therapy at that time. So why is there all this excitement about radium-223? Well, there had been some initial studies that were phase one dose escalation studies followed by some phase two studies, which culminated in this phase three multicenter trial looking at radium-223. The patient group was fairly well-defined in this group. There were some additional inclusion and exclusion criteria as would be befitting of a clinical trial. And the results were eventually published in the New England Journal of Medicine earlier uh, in 2013, in the summer of 2013. And these are what they found, is that they actually saw a survival benefit in these patients who were treated with radium-223. So this is why I changed my title a little bit from palliation of bone disease to actually therapy of bone disease. This is a therapeutic agent with the intention to treat the patient's malignancy, not just palliate their pain. And you can see it's not a, not a tremendous benefit, but the overall improved survival in the patients in the top group for overall survival without radium-223, the median overall survival was 11.3 months. With radium-223, it went up to 14.9 months. 
the uh, time the first symptomatic skeletal event was prolonged slightly between the uh, for the radium group as opposed to the untreated group. When I see other therapies coming along for prostate carcinoma, chemotherapies, the curves look very similar to this. So again, although the curves are not markedly disparate and the, the extension of survival by three to four months doesn't seem like a, a great deal of response, this is kind of the um, type of curves that we're seeing with many of the new agents coming along. So we, we haven't seen in a long time something that just dramatically changes, say, for Gleevec with uh, some of the GI stromal tumors. We saw a huge survival benefit. But a lot of the therapies that are coming through these days show these similar degrees of response. This was a, a fairly exhaustive list of some of the side effects that they saw in these patients. In the left-hand column are the patients treated with radium-223. In the right-hand columns are those treated with placebo, so it was a placebo-controlled trial. Rather than go through this line by line, I'll just say that in many of these cases as you go down, you see that the side effects are exactly the same between the two groups, including many of the hematologic parameters. So despite the fact that we checked the blood levels before each administration of radium-223 for things like anemia for things like thrombocytopenia, there were only minor, if any, changes between the placebo and the control group. So at MD Anderson, uh, this, is the, this is the process. When we receive a request from radium-223, and it's usually coming from our medical oncologists, um, other areas in the country, this might be coming from urology or um, from uh, other groups, primary, primary care physicians. In, in our group, it's primarily the GI on, GU oncologists that are seeing these patients. But when we receive the record, uh, receive the request, I, I personally at this point sit down and review all these just so we have one person reviewing um, the entry criteria. I think consistency is important. I look to confirm that they have a histologic diagnosis of castration-resistant prostate carcinoma. I review what prior therapies the patients had and confirm that the patient's not currently on chemotherapy. So, um, like I said, we've had a few that the decision has been made to treat them with chemotherapy at the same time. But in most cases, we would prefer them to be treated with radium alone and not with chemotherapy. And that becomes a discussion between the referring clinician and I if there's going to be a violation of that. I review the laboratory values to make sure they meet those initial values and look at the imaging studies that they've had, CT scans, bone scans, etc., and then approve them to be scheduled. When we go through the authorization process, so we clear all these ahead of time with the insurance providers, either Medicare or private insurance, and we actually um, pre-authorize the entire course of therapy. And this is what we proposed for our patients at MD Anderson. They'll get treated with radium-223 in their initial dose, and we would like to have a baseline sodium fluoride PET-CT scan at that time of initial therapy. So we would do the sodium fluoride PET-CT in the morning and then administer the radium in the afternoon. For some of these patients, they will have already had an MDP bone scan. And then based on the results of that bone scan, their clinician will decide that they're a candidate for therapy with radium-223. We don't then repeat another sodium fluoride within a short period of time. They've already had one bone imaging study, and we think it's unnecessary to repeat one just to have that baseline sodium fluoride. If it's more than 45 days, we'll go ahead and repeat a sodium fluoride PET-CT scan um, to document their baseline status. They'll then go ahead and get their second dose of radium third dose of radium, then the day they come back for their fourth dose of radium, these are a month apart, we'll do another PET-CT, sodium fluoride PET-CT in the morning, and administer their radium in the afternoon. And then they'll get their fourth dose, fifth dose, and sixth dose, and that will complete their course of radium therapy. So currently it's approved for six monthly doses and no further than that. And then we're going to schedule the patients to come back for a final sodium fluoride PET-CT bone scan at about um, three months after that final therapy. So if you look at the timeline, they get treated on day zero. At about three months, they'll get their first set of imaging. And then five months, they'll be completed. And in about eight months, they'll have that final sodium fluoride PET-CT. As I sit down and talk to the patients and go through the consent process, I talk with them about the goals of therapy, again, emphasizing that this is truly a therapy for the malignancy, that it's not just trying to palliate their pain, but the goal is to potentially achieve some effect on the tumor itself, as well as symptomatic improvement. So in that New England Journal article, they didn't really look at the, the effectiveness of radium-223 as a palliative agent, but it does seem to have a significant degree of bone palliation as well, similar to what we saw with strontium and samarium. I talk to them about the common side effects, and I really talk about three things only. Um, that is the decrease in the blood counts, 
But again, at MD Anderson, and I'll show you some case examples at the end of this, we really haven't seen much in the way of marrow suppression. And if anything, some of these patients, their counts improve while on the radium therapy as you treat their malignancy. I talked to them about a flare in the bone pain. Um, in, the, in the prospective trial, they saw this in about a third of the patients. Our personal experience at MD Anderson has been about 80% of the patients will get a flare in pain after their initial dose of, of radium-223. Sometimes it's very mild, and they just say that they can tell that they receive the radium, they ache a little bit more, something is different. But we've had several patients that have required either significant narcotic use in the time after initial radium therapy, and we've had one or two that have required external beam palliative radiation therapy for pain control after that initial dose of radium. We're going to go back and look at our data in a much more systematic fashion to really understand. It seems like the patients who have a lot of pain at baseline may be a little bit more susceptible to pain flare, but we need to look at our data systematically to prove that. Uh, but most of our patients will experience some change in their symptoms, some worsening in their symptoms after their first dose of radium. It's usually worse with the first dose, maybe get a little bit with the second dose. By the third dose, most patients are feeling better and don't experience flare. But I make sure to talk to them about this ahead of time so that they understand that there may be this transient increase in pain following that initial therapy. The literature would also say that about a third of the patients will get GI symptoms, and that was a significant difference between the um, radium group and the placebo group. As we'll see in just a minute, this is primarily due to the fact that radium is not excreted through the renal system, but it's excreted through the colon, and it actually comes out with a fecal route of excretion. And that transient radiation load to the colon can result in some irritability, which may be some constipation, diarrhea, upset stomach, things like that. The, the tricky thing about this patient group is that they often are constipated, have diarrhea, you know, they have symptoms related to their cancer and other therapies, so it may be difficult to tell. The literature would say one-third of our patients that have that. Our experience has been it's much less. Maybe 10 to 20 percent of our patients have GI symptoms. And then finally, I'll talk to them about radiation safety precautions, which actually is a very easy thing with radium-223. Alpha particles being so heavy and highly charged have very little penetrability. So unlike beta particles, which can penetrate some distance, and unlike gamma photons, which can go through many different materials and require lead shielding, alpha particles can be stopped by tissue paper. They can be stopped by skin. And when we inject it, we use an unshielded syringe because the alpha particles themselves don't penetrate even the water that they're contained in. So it's very low penetrability. So for radium-223, about 60% of the activity, these are slides um, from, the initial, uh, from the official Bayer package insert, 60% um, of the activity is taken up by the bone within four hours. Of the unbound radium-223, most of it's excreted from the body within one week, mainly by the fecal route, and less than 5% through the urine. The dose from the radium is actually very, very low to both the healthcare providers and to the family members. So I put this slide up just to make the point that if you look at it on a um, megabecquerel basis, the exposure rate from radium-223 and technetium-99M are actually the same, 0.02. But when you look at what an actual patient dose is, say 14.8 um, for a uh, sorry for a technetium-99M giving um, 20 millicuries for a bone scan, that dose would be 14.8. Our doses of radium-223 are much, much lower. They're on the order of microcuries, and so the actual dose is 0.07. So even though the exposure rate per millicurie is the same, or per uh, becquerel, the actual exposure on a realistic basis is much lower. So what I tell the patients and their families when they come in is there's really only a few things to be considered. And the only way the, patient, the radium is going to get out of the patient's body and expose somebody else is if that other person gets it inside their body. And the way to get radium inside your body is to eat it, breathe it, or getting it into a broken area of skin. The only way it's coming out of the patient's body is essentially through the feces. So their precautions are just to wash their hands thoroughly after using the restroom. And that usually gets a laugh because the Hopefully everyone is washing their hands after they use the restroom. It's not any different than good standard hygiene. And that's really all there is to it. So the radium is not going to come out through the sweat, saliva, anything else. It's primarily the fecal route of excretion. And as long as they're using good hygiene, then there really are no more radiation precautions. This is an interesting statistic. Because of the low penetrability of the alpha particles, a person would have to be standing at one meter from the patient without moving for 119 days to receive 100 millirem, which is the limit for exposure in the U.S. So literally, 
You can send them out into the public once you do the injection. No precautions as far as returning to work, being around other people, being around children. There is virtually no external radiation exposure from radium-223. So after I discuss all that with the patient, I tell them that the actual injection is going to be somewhat anticlimactic that you, it's a syringe full of essentially very dilute salt water. It's about five cc's, you inject it, and they go. And I've never had anyone yet had a reaction, any sort of sensation. It's very much a, uh, a benign administration. I'll just talk for a few minutes about sodium fluoride bone scanning because we have incorporated this into our protocol for radium-223, as you can see. I understand you have quite a bit of experience with radium-223 here in Kuwait, and we found this to be an excellent bone imaging agent. Um, it does show you areas of, of degenerative disease, but it can also help differentiate in problematic patients, such as this patient with prostate carcinoma who had activity in the acetabulum that was felt to be suspicious on a conventional bone scan but on sodium fluoride was clearly seen to represent a benign subchondral cyst. And it's been shown in the literature to have quite good sensitivity, specificity, and positive predictive value for patients with um, osseous metastatic disease. This is an analysis of patients with breast carcinoma. So these are the types of patients we see with prostate carcinoma. These are usually not subtle patients. They have known osseous metastatic disease. They're symptomatic. So we're not doing this necessarily to detect subtle sites of disease. We're using it to document activity at baseline and then in follow-up to see what effect the radium is having and hopefully document a positive response to therapy. So this gentleman had very coalescent disease. One note of caution about sodium fluoride, and I'm sure you have learned this here as well, is that it's very good about telling you disease in the bone, including lytic disease, such as in this patient with lung carcinoma. Even very small metastases, such as this one in the pedicle of the vertebral body, can show some increased uptake, a very small subtle lytic lesion on CT scanning. But it doesn't tell you anything about the soft tissues. So we can certainly miss a large 8-centimeter pulmonary mass in this case because it shows no activity on sodium fluoride. So as we do these in the prostate cancer patients, I'm also having to look at the lymph nodes, look at the kidneys, look at the lungs. You know, there's a lot that goes into that interpretation beyond what you would see just from the fluoride by itself. So I'm going to finish in the last few minutes just showing you a couple of case examples, reminding you that, that we're fairly early on in this process. So it became FDA approved at the beginning of July in 20, uh, 2013. If you look at the timeline then, we would be, we administered our first dose in early August of 2013. Our first patients just completed their six-month course of radium in about February of 2014, and they're not due for that final sodium fluoride bone scan until beginning next month. So we've not gone all the way through this cycle. But nevertheless, I can share with you what our experience has been. Thus far, we've treated 76 patients since the initiation of the approval in uh, August of, of 2013, it should be. We've had 291 individual administrations of radium-223. About 20 patients have completed their full course of radium at this point. Um, and you can see where they fall on this uh, spectrum. 20 of them have gone through all six, and then we have various people at various places along that spectrum. We have had some patients that have not made it through the entire course of therapy, and that's to be expected. Um, these patients may develop visceral metastatic disease, and we're seeing these at that sodium fluoride PET-CT bone scan that's performed right before their fourth dose. We've seen some dural metastases. We've seen lung metastases, liver metastases. So just because this is treating the bones doesn't mean that other sites of disease might not occur. And these patients generally have very advanced disease. So there is some degree of attrition. Again, we're going to go back and analyze our data. It doesn't seem like we're having patients fall off because they can't tolerate the radium. Um, we've only had one or two patients that have had issues with the blood counts. So the first case example is a patient with uh, prostate carcinoma, Gleason 4 plus 4, has had multiple prior therapies, beginning with surgery, followed by radiation therapy, widespread metastatic disease, now presents with increasing skeletal pain. He did receive all six doses of radium. You can see the doses here in megabecquerels. It's uh, calculated according to weight, 50 kilobecquerels per kilogram. So that will vary a little bit depending on what the patient's weight is at the time of administration. Two more this was his baseline PET-CT scan. This is his hemoglobin. You can see that that uh, went up initially, then kind of tracked up and down, but was above normal values at all points. Um, his white cell count bounced up and down a little bit, but no significant trend. Platelets were fine during the therapy. His PSA initially was climbing, then started to go back down. Here's his baseline, and then month three sodium fluoride PET-CT. As I said, we haven't reached that final PET-CT scan yet. And really no change. As I look at this, maybe some very subtle changes, but overall it looks like the disease is relatively stable from baseline to follow-up. 
And the SUVs you can see are about the same at various areas as well. I try to pick three or four of the hottest lesions and measure those as the index lesions. The sacrum, interestingly, went down quite a bit, but not sure what that means at this point. And symptomatically, he felt much better after the initiation of radium. I'm going to skip this next patient since we're running a little bit low on time and show you example number three. He's in the midst of therapy. 66-year-old man, Gleason 3 plus 4, had had a radical prostatectomy, um, had some uh, disease that was responding, um, had some bilateral uh, retroperitoneal lymph nodes, received chemotherapy as well as cipolucyl T, um, had a rising PSA, markedly elevated PSA, his bone scan showed metastatic disease, so you can see his baseline MDP. About a month and a half later, he had a radium, uh, had a sodium fluoride right before the radium. Here's his doses of radium. He's had four doses so far. Hemoglobin started low, has drifted downwards a little bit, but is still within normal range. White cell count's fine. Platelets have been fine. He actually had a positive response. So if you look at his individual osseous metastases, they have generally decreased in intensity, but at the same time, overall skeletal activity has risen somewhat. And this is a phenomenon we've seen on some of our patients. And again, we're not really sure what this means at this point, but if you look at the SUVs, they fell from 67 to 29 or 30, 55 down to 29. So the individual lesions look like they are indeed Certainly we're interested in looking at this with other types of tumors, breast cancer, other GU tumors. One interest we have in particular at MD Anderson is in osteosarcoma. We have a phase one dose escalation trial running currently. And just as a final set of slides, this is a patient we treated back in 2009 on a compassionate IND with advanced osteosarcoma involving the mandible and adjacent soft tissues. We treated with radium. This is the alkaline phosphatase. And after the initiation of radium, you can see the alkphos fell very dramatically started to go back up at this point, and then that is, that's as far as we got into this patient's therapy. A baseline and follow-up FDG PET-CT showed a fairly significant reduction in intensity following the initiation of radium therapy. And this is what a radium image looks like. So because there are some gamma photons coming out, it is possible to generate images from a radium-223 study. They're pretty low count and pretty noisy, but it can serve to verify that the radium is localizing two areas of tumor. So in summary, radium-223 was recently approved by the FDA for use in men with prostate cancer in the U.S. We're getting some experience with the use of this agent, learning more about where its application is and what its outcome is going to show. But certainly, we're only reaching the tip of the iceberg as far as applicability of this agent, looking at its use in other tumors, including breast carcinoma, as well as primary bone-forming tumors such as osteosarcoma, as well as using it in the adjuvant setting combined with chemotherapy and external beam radiation therapy. Thank you.